My name is David Emerson. I'm a senior research scientist at Bigelow Laboratory. And I just want to really say how much I appreciate people uh, joining us this evening. Um, I'm a microbiologist. I've been at Bigelow for almost 13 years. And I will talk a little bit more about myself as the talk goes on. But and just to give you a little background on Bigelow, we're a nonprofit research institute and uh, discovery solutions, inspiration that we create are made possible with help of our generous supporters. And I want to start today by thanking each of our donors, our board members, our advisory board members for their support. And I, you know, I, the, the, the Financial support we get from donors is really important for Bigelow. We're, as we're, we are a soft money institution, as we refer to ourselves. We're a small nonprofit oceanographic institute on the coast of Maine. Uh, we live in an amazing place. We have an amazing building. We really do do re world-class research here, and it's really uh, made in significant part through the donors that we have. And I especially want to reach out to a couple of anonymous donors and the Long Cove Foundation who, who, who helped support some of the work I'm gonna discuss this evening. And I also wanna thank H.M. Payson, who's a Maine-based financial services firm who's been supporting the Cafe Scientifique um, talks that we've been having this summer and they've been doing this for several years. We really appreciate that. A little bit of logistics, um, since this is a Zoom meeting, uh, so the <clears throat> chat box and things like that that you normally could use in Zoom are not available, but there is a Q&A button that you can send in your questions during any time of my talk. So the talk's gonna be essentially two parts and there will be a, a break in the middle. Um, so as you hear me talking and come up with questions you want answered, just type them into that, through that Q&A button. And, and they will be addressed um, by Stephen Profeser, who's our communications director, um, will be answering, asking me the questions. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So the sort of central theme to my presentation or my talk this evening is, is how do we go from a molecule to an ecosystem? Or what can a molecule tell us about an ecosystem? And this is a question that's sort of been of interest to me for a long time. And a little bit about my background. So I grew up in Maine and I went to College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor where I got a Bachelor of Arts degree in human ecology. And now if you ask any student who went to COA what human ecology is, you'll probably get a slightly different answer. Um, but I think we'd all agree that it's something about sort of the interconnectedness of humans with their environment and their society and essentially with their ecosystem. And it's a, it's a very holistic way of looking at things. And so that's sort of the, the broad picture, but then I became a, I then went to Cornell where I got a PhD in microbiology. And I started out wanting to study microbial ecology and I did study microbial ecology, but by the time I was finished, I was really aiming to more at biochemistry. So I got very much more into the molecule in the ecosystem. And that was really the trend of the times. Um, I'd say microbial ecology as a science has developed significantly since then. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But anyway, it's sort of that dichotomy, I guess, between going from the, the ecosystem, the whole view to the molecule, which is the very reductionist view. Um, and how do you, how do you, um, sort of integrate those two things. And I think we're able to do that now to a much greater degree than we were certainly 30 odd years ago when I started out. Um, so just again, to introduce the ecosystem, I wanna just show what might be one of the most iconic photographs ever sh taken by a human being. And this is from the Apollo 8 uh, moon mission where they photographed the earth rise. And in the foreground, of course, you can see the desolate surface of the moon, lifeless and rising up out of the darkness is the blue planet, uh, the oceans, the clouds, you can see the continents. 
So this really showed us that Earth is an ecosystem. And it's not just, and we realize, of course, it's not just one ecosystem, it's made up of many component ecosystems, whether it's the open ocean, the coastal ocean, terrestrial ecosystems, atmospheric ecosystems. Um, so this is just <clears throat> sort of bringing home this really, uh, I don't think there's a better way to sort of bring home this concept of, of that we all live in an ecosystem and are connected through that. And we need to understand it um, better and better. And so how does this lead to the, to the molecule? So this is another iconic photograph from the 20th century, one of the perhaps one of the most iconic photographs of biology in the 20th century. Uh, this picture here of Francis Crick holding a, a slide rule and pointing out some aspect of the DNA double helix to Jim Watson who this picture was taken in 1953 when I think Watson was what, 24 years old or something. And they had just elucidated the structure of DNA for the first time. And this is certainly one of the milestones in biology. Um, understanding the chemical structure of DNA proved that you know, this was the informational biomolecule that, that passes information through um, genes and is really you know what encodes us as people codes all life and it's a universal molecule to all life and the discovery of how it forms this double helix led to understanding quite quickly really uh, how it replicates this led to the understanding of genes created the revolution in molecular biology which has totally transformed biology from where it was in the first half of the 20th century to or to 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 where we are today. So this is the molecule that, for understanding the ecosystem. So now I'm gonna introduce another fellow. If this were a, a um, live audience, I now ask for a show of hands of who, how many people actually recognize who this guy is. Um, and my guess is that not a lot of people um, would raise their hands. I would be very surprised if more than a quarter of the audience did, maybe only 10%. Anyway, this guy is Carl Woese, who was a professor at the University of Illinois. And what Carl Woese did was to develop this DNA-based systematics to describe biology. And many of us think that Carl Woese made as great or perhaps even greater contributions to biology than Jim Watson and, and Francis Crick. Um, and this photograph is kind of interesting. It shows Carl leaning over a, a light table and on that light table are some x-ray films with little black dots on them. And that's what Carl used to sort of understand, you know, the systematics of life. And basically what that is, is early um, DNA molecules, not early DNA molecules, but early analysis of DNA molecules from bacteria. And this was, this was state of the art technology back in the 1970s as he was teasing apart um, this DNA from bacteria and understanding how they were related. And this sort of revolutionized as our view, certainly as a microbiologist, a microbiologist, this was a very revolutionary um, thing because we had never really understood what bacteria related to other bacteria and then how they were related to life in general. Um, so Carl Woese was the fellow who really developed this. And he was a very iconoclastic individual. He didn't like to travel. He almost never gave public talks. I got to see Carl speak once. It was one of the worst talks I've ever seen. He kind of mumbled along for about 20 or 30 minutes and showed a couple of view graphs. Um, but absolutely brilliant in those papers that he wrote and really revolutionized how we see life. And I'll just point that out in this, this Next slide here, which really is on the trees of life. And so on the, so this tree we're looking at here is sort of the classic morphological based tree of life that derived really from you know, Charles Darwin and the evolution of origin of species and how you had vertical evolution and you saw these morphological changes. And through the much of the 20th century, these trees were developed largely based along morphological lines as well as behavioral lines. 
um, the traits of sex, things like that, that we use to develop trees of life. But they weren't really based on genetics or DNA. Um, and so Carl Woese developed his trees back in the, starting in the 1980s that really changed how we viewed um, the microbial world. <laughs> and now this is a modern gene-based tree of life. And you can see there's just these many, many branches. And I'll just point out that almost all the branches, so there's a few branches down here in the eukaryotes that are what we would call higher organisms, vertebrates, our cells, for example. This large cluster up here is all bacteria. And there's another group of archaea here, which are, which are very similar to bacteria. And almost all, about 90% of the branches or more on here are actually single-celled organisms. And so for the microbes, this has been absolutely revolutionary in terms of, and this is all based on basically being able to go out and take uh, DNA out of the environment and analyze it without actually being able to necessarily grow these organisms in the lab. This entire purple branch that I'm circling here um, was all entirely uh, based on sequences that we've extracted from the environment. We actually don't really have any of these organisms growing in the laboratory. We've developed methods now where we can go in and analyze uh, for function. So we can start to figure out what these organisms are doing, um, who they're related to, what their functions may be in the environment, sort of what their ecology is. Um, again, this is all based around uh, um, genomic based and genetic based methods. And this was really <laughs> the approach that Carl Woese developed and is now developed into uh, an entire field of, of biology. So this brings us to the, um, so this analysis of DNA and genomics is, is, is just reiterated, has really revolutionized our view of, of, of life on earth and change the way that we view microbial communities as well as our cells. And so that question is now, can we use it to change, to understand ecosystems and to change how our understanding of ecosystems? So this brings me to environmental DNA. Um, so environmental DNA is defined as um, genetic material as Obtain, obtained directly from the environment, so, so, soil, sediment, water, et cetera, without any obvious signs of the biological source material. This is from a definition by Thompson and Willerslev, who are a couple of Danish scientists. And I've just shown here a, a picture of a chromosome. So all uh, plant animal life, of course, have cells with nucleus, nucleus, a nucleus in them with chromosomes. That chromosome is what the D, that contains the DNA material. And as you unwind all that, you end up with this string of letters here. And so the concept is that while every all same species have very high uh, identities in their DNA, as you move out to different genera and different families, you start seeing more and more differences. And by reading those letters there, you can actually put together a family tree, just as I showed in the previous slides. So what these biologists did was to think that you could actually go out in the environment and just take DNA out of the environment, not having whole cells there, but just that was free in the environment, um, that had either been sloughed off of a fish, say, or was potentially fecal material that had been left behind by an animal. And, and use that as a, as a DNA signature. Now, if you had told me this in, if in 2015, I would have said, ah, that's not gonna work because there's all these bacteria out there that are gonna chew up all that DNA. And so there won't be much remaining. Um, but these guys went ahead and did this anyway, and they've shown that it really does work. Uh, and that's gonna be a, a focus of my talk. And this, so it really gives us this, sort of forensics for the ocean or CSI for the ocean. So now to explain a little bit more about eDNA, um, environmental DNA, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here and I'm gonna play a video that was 
um, done a few years ago by a group of Colby students here at Bigelow. Um, that was sort of their take on environmental DNA. It's about a two long animated, two minute long animated video. And I think it does a nice job of sort of introducing the concept. So with that, I will start the video. This is my dog, Rover. Everywhere he goes, he sheds. Since I can see Rover's hair even when I can't see him, I can figure out where he's been. Just like Rover, all living things leave behind traces wherever they go. Sometimes we can see them, like hair or scales or feathers, but they all leave behind invisible traces of themselves, like DNA. DNA stores our body's instructions for what we look like, how we move, and how we live. Each strand of DNA is one of a kind. No two people or dogs have the same DNA. But all people have very similar DNA and all dogs have very similar DNA. That's why people and dogs look different. We can find this left behind DNA from different living things all around us. From your house, to the peaks of mountains, to the bottom of the ocean. This type of DNA is called environmental DNA, or eDNA for short. Every living thing, from the smallest bacteria and viruses to the gigantic blue whale, leaves behind eDNA wherever it goes. If scientists were trying to figure out where whales live and where they move, they would have to wait a really long time to see one. Even though whales are huge, they're hard to find. So finding, catching, and tagging every single whale in the ocean would be very time consuming and expensive, not to mention very difficult. With eDNA, we can figure out where the whale has been even if the whale isn't there anymore. By taking just a small sample of water, scientists can use eDNA to learn about all sorts of plants and animals, big or small. eDNA is convenient for scientists to sample large areas repeatedly. This allows us to see the health of an area and the health of its species. We can see how many species are in each sample of water and even discover new species with eDNA. It's also a good way to detect harmful or invasive creatures and diseases as they spread to new areas of the ocean like how the invasive Asian green crab hurts Maine's native blue mussel population. Figuring out where invasive creatures are headed before they can do any damage helps us protect our seas. eDNA helps us keep our oceans healthy and happy. So, that was great. Um, we really love that um, animation. And actually, I should mention that Sydney Greenlee, who is one of the primary drivers of that, is now a graduate student um, at the University of Maine, is, is starting to work here at Bigelow this summer on eDNA. So that's exciting for us. Uh, so just to give a few details on how eDNA works, I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, technical aspects here. But basically, the concept is you can go out and collect a sample of water, usually about a liter, or maybe a quart, something like that like that of water. Uh, if it's water, you run it onto a filter that uh, filters out all the particles in it, which includes some DNA. Uh, if it's sediment, you just take the sediment and do a DNA isolation directly from that. But the principle is that you isolate DNA. And then there's a couple of uh, things you can do with the DNA. Um, one is uh, to do sort of a, a, a quantitative analysis. We use what's called quantitative PCR. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what PCR is. And my guess is that if I had asked pre-COVID uh, what PCR was, maybe a quarter or half the hands might have gone up. I'm guessing now post-COVID that a lot of hands would go up since PCR is, is the primary test that's used to see if you actually have the virus. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, the, the beauty of the PCR method is that you can amplify DNA from a single species uh, using, using uh, what we call primers for that are specific for a specific species. And that allows you to make many, many copies of that gene. It gives you a, an ability to sort of quantify how abundant that organism its interest is. The alternative method is to do what's called metabarcoding, which is a fancy word we use for sequencing all the DNA in a sample, and then using a computer to identify all the sequences, compare those sequences to a database. And then from that, you can estimate community diversity, do relative abundance of species, and get sort of a holistic view of all the organisms that are in a, in a sample versus the, the PCR method, which gives you maybe one or a few organisms, gives you a little bit better quantitative estimate of how many of those organisms are there, but doesn't give you the uh, sort of view of the entire community. 
Um, so moving into a couple of examples here. Uh, so this is an ex a paper that was published uh, in 2016 by a group. And this is sort of one of the first really nice demonstrations of how you could use the eDNA to identify fish populations. And they went off the coast of Greenland. This was, again, a Danish group that did this. So they were sampling uh, here off uh, the east coast or the west coast of Greenland. And what they did is they went out with where they do conventional fishing trawls, which is one of the ways that they assess fish populations. And so they went out and did these fish trawls, but then they also collected water at the same time. And they did eDNA on the water, and then they compared that to what they actually brought up in the trawl. And you can see in these Venn diagrams here, these two circles, uh, what results they found and where the circles overlap is where they found the same species both by trawling and by eDNA. And you can see there were a couple species they found only by trawling, but they were found three additional species by eDNA. So again, just collecting the, a few liters of water and looking at the DNA that was in these. And this, as I said, was one of the, one of the first really nice demonstrations, a proof of, proof of concept. They pointed out in their paper, there were some interesting findings. For example, the Greenland shark here, which is of course a large, probably the largest fish of all these groups, were, were actually very rare in the trawls, but were actually more common in the eDNA. And they figured this is just because a shark probably can avoid a trawl net fairly efficiently, but it still leaves behind its DNA signature. Uh, another example, it, I just got some data very recently uh, that, uh, uh, of, of another example of a fisheries study uh, is, is from the Wells uh, Estuarine Preserve down in Wells, Maine. And this was data that literally got yesterday from uh, Laura Crane, who's at the Wells NERR, the National Estuarine Research Reserve, and Allison Watts, who's at UNH. And so they've been doing for a long time studies there where, where the, in the estuary where they take a net and um, do a short trawl, just a small net. And basically they're looking for sort of larval stages of fish uh, and they bring those back and they identify them either visually or under the microscope. It's just that these are either larval stages or uh, either, well, some of them are minnows and then some of them are larval stages of fish. And, and the important thing to point out here is these, this, these again, we're using, looking at these Venn diagrams and there's the rose colored circles, which is the eDNA and the uh, lime green circles here, which is the net survey and the sort of the traditional view of, of how they've traditionally identified fish here. And you can see that in some cases there's some overlap um, but if you look at August and October, and this is all from 2019, the traditional method, they actually weren't able to identify any of the organisms, the fish in these, and yet by eDNA, they were identified a number of different species. Uh, one thing that I find very interesting is they identified Atlantic halibut. Now, certainly if you were a fisherman, you wouldn't go fishing for halibut in, the, in an estuary up a river um, on the coast. They, you go off the coast, uh, more of the deep water fish. So the question is then, was this just some DNA from this halibut that came into the estuary that sort of was washed in essentially or came in on the currents? Or are there juvenile halibut that are actually coming into the estuary? And they, they, they didn't find by their traditional net methods, but that they are present there and you see the DNA signature. So these are some of the types of questions that you can ask with eDNA. It also points up a little bit of a shortcoming of eDNA or one of the challenges for it is that it doesn't tell us anything about the life cycle, especially the fish, the age of the fish, the size of the fish, the biomass. Um, it just tells us whether they're there or not. And it does give us some kind of an abundance estimate. Um, but as far as understanding you know, ages and things like that, there may be possible ways of, of getting at some of those questions um, through molecular biology, but right now those are definitely great challenges. 
So then the question really is, you know, will eDNA unify ecological and environmental sciences? And I think this is a really uh, sort of profound question and a really interesting one. And the idea is that, you know, from one liter of water, can you really go to identify from bacteria to whales? And I would say that because these eDNA techniques are similar across disciplines, there's the promise that we can transcend these sort of normal discipline boundaries. And these are, you know, real boundaries, right? I don't normally talk to fisheries people. Uh, we don't really have that much in common. We don't use similar techniques normally. And I'll just show this is sort of a species evaluation methods um, that are traditional. For example, with fisheries, it's trawl surveys, electrofishing, sometimes visual surveys, sometimes diver surveys. Uh, so these are very different from doing going out and extracting or isolating DNA and then analyzing it, which has a quite a lot of commonality in terms of the actual procedures that you use and the way that you analyze the data. And so I think you know this has real promise for us to be able to transcend some of these normal disciplinary boundaries, and that's pretty exciting in terms of being able to actually go out and talk to fisheries people, talk to people who study seaweeds, invertebrates, and we're doing that in our projects with uh, Maine eDNA, which we're excited about. And I've certainly learned uh, quite a lot about fish, but certainly not enough to uh, identify them, even by eDNA. Um, and this brings us up to sort of managing the, managing coastal ecosystems is a challenge. And this is of, of Maine's coastal ecosystem, especially. Obviously, we have a lot of different uses for our coastal ecosystems, from recreation to fishing. Um, we're very proud of how sort of relatively pristine our coastal ecosystem is. And uh, so, how do we manage that? How do we maintain that? And how can eDNA help? And that's really going to be sort of the main purpose or the main theme of my second part of my talk. But I'm going to stop here for a minute and take questions. And again, so you can use this Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them. And I look forward to taking a, hearing some good questions. Thanks, Dave. Our first question is, so for higher organisms, how do you know the animal was there because you found its DNA and not that you found it because whatever ate it, pooped it, and that's what you're looking at? Uh, yeah, that's a trophic cascade of a different type. Um, so that's, that's one of the fundamental questions, especially with looking at, at sort of this eDNA or this, what we, we might refer to as free DNA. And so what we've been finding or other people have been finding as well is, is that the residence time doesn't seem to be that long. Um, because that's one of the big questions, right? If, 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 if a fish swims by, say, the Damariscotta River, which I'm looking at right now, uh, and leaves a DNA trace, will that last for weeks, days, hours? And it appears that it's quite localized, that we only see these over, you know, fairly localized areas of within, you know, say, a few kilometers. Um, and this is really important to understand. So we don't really understand that well. Uh, it's still a fundamental question is how long the DNA lasts. And I would actually come back and probably as a microbiologist argue bacteria, which is that you know, the DNA probably does get degraded pretty quickly um, by microbes that, for example, that sloughed off either a fish or a seaweed or a, a lobster or something like that. Um, and so that may actually be to our advantage in terms of lowering that residence time, which then makes the, the estimates more accurate in terms of when those organs were actually there. In terms of the question of, of another organism pooping out um, DNA from, a, for example, from a shark or something like that, that's either a fish, another fish, um, or obviously um, a phytoplankton or uh, other organisms, that is Again, it comes down to sort of the likelihood uh, that that DNA will be there. And we don't really have, we haven't really seen much evidence of, of finding um, 
of finding sort of the, the organisms that have been eaten by other organisms in their DNA. Now there's a whole nother area of research, especially in terrestrial systems, where you go out and, and actually sample fecal material. And you can actually, then you can learn a lot about the diet. But that DNA is probably, especially in the ocean, gets diluted so quickly that um, it would only be a very small component. It's something you still have to be aware of though especially if you're looking for something that's very rare. Thanks, Dave. Next question is, does eDNA give you an accurate idea of the relative abundance of a species? Um, again, another question that we're figuring out, certainly for bacteria, we think that that works pretty well. There's a number of caveats that go along with that because, again, we use this PCR method, which is a method of amplifying genes. And we know that there are some biases related to that, that it amplifies or some organisms' DNA better than other organisms. We don't always understand exactly the molecular reason for that. Um, but it's one of those things that you have to try to run the appropriate controls to understand. Now, whether for fish and for uh, higher organisms, how well the relative abundance is gonna work, there's some signs that it, that it does give you some, in, some good, pretty good indicators of, of sort of relative abundance. Um, again, that's still something that the science I don't think is fully settled on, but uh, it's an important question that we still need to resolve. Okay, the next question is, could one use eDNA to test for the presence of great white sharks in nearly real time? <laughs> uh, so interesting question, of course, with the, with the recent shark attack um, down off Bailey Island. In fact, I was just talking to my colleague Pete Countway and they were down sampling um, for eDNA right off um, near uh, off Bailey Island uh, just a few days ago, but, uh, just a, a, maybe a, a few days after the shark attack. Um, so first, would you be able to detect the great white shark DNA? Absolutely. Um, people have been doing that. Sharks are a little trickier maybe because they don't have scales. Uh, they may not, we don't really know. I don't think we have a good sense of the shedding rate of DNA from sharks. Um, so that's an important aspect of the more DNA an organism sheds, obviously, the more you're going to find of it. <coughs> Uh, but people have shown that they can detect sharks. In terms of finding it in real time, that's also a challenge that um, I'll bring up Pete again. So he's working and I'll show a little bit of this later is that we do have sort of these PCR instruments that we can take out into the field and we'll give an answer within a couple of hours. So, and there are new technologies that are coming out that may be even more rapid that within an hour or two, um, whether we'll get to an absolute dipstick technology, I'm not sure when that would happen, um, where you'd be able to get an answer within, within you know, minutes versus hours. But certainly we're getting down to the point where it's a few hours that you can get an answer for a specific species. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, in the interest of time, let's move on to the second half of the talk and we'll come back to questions at the end. Okay, great. Yeah, so now I'm gonna move sort of more into the coastal Maine and then talk about a big project that we've just been ramping up and started in the last year. Uh, this is a, a project funded by the National Science Foundation, their EPSCOR program, it's a, which is a program that sort of funds uh, research to states that generally are a little lagging maybe in the amount of federal research that they get. Um, but it's a large award, a $20 million five-year award that was awarded um, to the University of Maine and to Bigelow and to a group of, another group of, a group of other institutions, which I'll just talk about in a minute. Um, and the title of the, of the project is, again, this molecule ecosystem and its environmental DNA is a nexus of coastal ecosystem sustainability for Maine, or Maine eDNA. And this uh, project is really built around three major research areas or themes. One is sustainable fisheries, is harmful and shifting species, and then a, a macro system sort of eDNA integration. I'll go through these uh, each individually in a minute. 
Um, there's, of course, a big education and training component to it, as well as an educate engagement and outreach. Uh, we also have what, uh, what we refer to as a, a science of team science component. There's actually a social science component, which is studying uh, sort of us as we work as together as scientists and how well we work as a team. And uh, that will also sort of help guide the research, I think, and help hopefully break down some of these disciplinary boundaries that I was talking about before. Uh, in terms of Bigelow, the Bigelow participants are uh, Pete Countway. The SRS participants are Pete Countway, uh, <coughs> Nicole Price, Doug Rasher, Nick Record, and myself. And then Leanne Whitney is a research scientist at Bigelow who also has a faculty position at Maine Maritime who's uh, participating in this project. So we're really excited about uh, getting this going. We got our funding last summer and have been ramping it up. Uh, just to give a little bit more detail about it, um, there's overall 32 senior personnel working from, uh, again, the University of Maine and Bigelow are the two major uh, players in this. Um, within the University of Maine, the Darling Marine Center, uh, which is sort of essentially across the river and a, a couple of miles further up the Dam Riscata is, a, is an important player in this as well. And we're looking forward to having more collaborations both with the university and with Darling, as well as a, a, a variety of other um, undergraduate and uh, institutions and, and other universities within the state. So for <coughs> The, the one of the primary components of this is, is education, as I said, and we're bringing in about 27, 21 graduate students. And importantly for us, seven of these are going to be associated with Bigelow. And this is in itself going to be something of an experiment. This will be the largest cohort of graduate students that we've had at the lab. Um, and some of them, they'll, they'll be co-advised by people at the University of Maine or at other uh, institutions within the state. But a number of them will be primarily based at Bigelow. There's also going to be five postdoctoral researchers who are involved, and three of those are going to be at Bigelow. There's a lot of undergraduates, and as I said, there's a total of about 13 different universities, colleges, and nonprofits that are involved in this project. And you know, the real goal here is to establish Maine as a leader in eDNA science and its applications. And so I'll just go through some of the opportunities that this uh, project we think affords and the first one is is supporting of sustainable fisheries and this has a couple of primary goals with any large project you really have to break it down into sort of component parts that you can really break into getting into detailed research on and so that's uh, what we've done here so this ecosystem-based restoration is really uh, focused a lot on alewives, which are anadromous fish. Um, certainly if you've ever watched an alewife run in Maine, it's pretty spectacular. Um, so alewives, again, they spawn in freshwater. <coughs> the young fish move out into the ocean, grow up and mature, and then return to the, up the rivers to the lakes um, to spawn again. And this is what's referred to as a trophic cascade because these organisms, because you know, they start out in the freshwater, they actually, mature, because they mature in the ocean and return to the freshwater again, um, they actually bring back a lot of nutrients. The fish themselves actually, they're, I mean, they're, they're protein, nitrogen, phosphorus sources. They die in the, in the lakes and they come in by the millions. And so they, they actually can have a significant impact just on the, on the nutrient supplies within lakes. And what's happened is that, and they also are food for predators. So what's happened over historical time in Maine in the last couple hundred years, of course, especially in the 1800s, we built a lot of dams on our rivers and this re re um, removed the ability of these fish to move back up into the lakes. As we remove dams, um, we're seeing them coming back. And so what are the effects of that gonna be? And one of the neat aspects of this project, this project's being led up by Mike Kennison, who's a professor at the University of Maine, um, is to actually go out and take cores of lakes. And one of the things, another thing you can do with eDNA is that it's preserved in sediments. And so you can actually take a core, which is essentially a time capsule, and go and extract the DNA from that core at different levels. 
and recreate or potentially recreate the fish populations that were say in a given lake over you know, maybe a thousand years. And so presumably alewives, if there was a dam removal, then alewives at one time had been had been present in high abundance at a lake. The dam was put in, they were removed essentially. Um, how did that affect the fish populations? And now that watch them return, we'll see what what effects. And you can actually try to make some predictions about what those effects are going to be. Another component of this project is revealing sort of early life ecology, or the what we refer to sometimes as the larval black box. And this is a project being headed up by Nicole Price at Bigelow. And this really gets at this question, especially for seaweeds, for invertebrates. Um, many marine organisms have larval stages um, as, as, as they develop. <clears throat> and those larval stages essentially are plankton that move through the water column. And that's really important for how these organisms get distributed, where they end up settling. It's quite challenging to actually study those stages in the water. You can do plankton net toes and then look at things in the microscope. And even then it can be quite difficult to distinguish different larval stages. DNA, it's actually relatively simple, relatively easy um, to distinguish those different stages of life just because they have quite different DNA signatures. So the goal here is to be able to look at those free swimming larval stages using eDNA and start to tease apart these relationships and how these organisms are distributed and spread around the coast. Um, so an outcome of this is to develop an eDNA framework for ecosystem-based fisheries and aquaculture. Another opportunity is really you know, pro around protecting people and the environment. And there's a couple of aspects of this project, of this theme within the, within the larger project. And one of them is harmful algal blooms. And this is a project being led up by Pete Countway um, at Bigelow. And so Pete's an expert in, in sort of the microbial eukaryotes in the ocean, including uh, the phytoplankton that can cause harmful algal blooms. And this image here is just showing uh, where Pete's gone out and with a group of uh, other researchers and they collected water samples all along the coast of Maine here. And they were looking for um, the Pseudonuchia organism, which is a, one, of, one of the more uh, toxic Harmful algal, harmful algae that are out there, and we've been seeing more Pseudonychia two or three years ago. There was a fairly major outbreak when this occurred, when this when this research was done. And what we're looking at here, the purple colors show that there's very few of these organisms present. Where it's bright red, that shows that they are abundant. And at the same time, they did this collection of, of DNA, they also collected water samples for toxins and they found that there was a very good correspondence up in Machias Bay here. There was quite a lot of toxin present. There's a high abundance of the organisms. It's relatively easy to get DNA. It's more laborious to actually do the toxin testing. So one of the goals here is that if you can um, do a more broad and robust sampling with DNA, then maybe you can start to understand you know, the life cycle, how these organisms are interacting, and how this may help sort of forecast or predict when these harmful algal blooms may occur, which is, you know, very important for the shellfish industry within the state. And to know when, when those types of things are going to happen would be really valuable, especially for well, both shellfish and aquaculture. Um, this is another example of looking actually in lakes this project's also involved is, is also looking at harmful algae in lakes as well as in the ocean. And this is a uh, Pete here demonstrating a, a, one of these handheld biomeme devices, which is a handheld rapid qPCR instrument. This, this graph shows the, the results here. This is to a group of Colby students up at Flagstaff Lake where they were sampling in the lake and then seeing what algae were present within a, within a couple of hours. Uh, so again, this, this utilization of, of sort of new technologies. Another uh, component of this project is the species on the move. And so I'm sure a number of you may have seen Doug Rasher's talk last week on the kelp forests of Maine. Uh, so this image here is just showing where kelp 
where there's a whole bunch of circles here. The more brown in those circles, the higher the density of kelp uh, cover is. It's interesting, my wife and I were just uh, kayaking off Roke Island this weekend, and it's amazing how much kelp is right along the shore there. Uh, whereas down here in the mid coast, uh, we generally have to go out more into deep water to see kelp, but you don't see it right in along the coast. But anyway, kelp is moving. Um, kelp's quite sensitive to water temperature. And so there's a general movement of these kelp beds, uh, or, or I guess there's more of a removal from the southern part of the, of the state where the water's warming more quickly or getting, the temperatures are getting higher. And they're seeing, uh, whereas the abundance in the, in the down east areas of the, of the state is, is maintaining itself. And so how those species are shifting in response to climate change is a really important question. Um, Doug didn't really talk about eDNA too much in his talk last week, but they're hoping to use, and they are using eDNA um, to look at these, uh, both kelp species, as well as the other organisms that are associated with these kelp beds, whether it's fish or uh, uh, other organisms that may live with the kelp. And another component of this is actually invasive species of, of looking either at species that are moving in because their, their habitat is, is changing, the water's warming, getting move, species moving in from the south, as well as picking up potentially invasive species that are just new introductions to the coast. Um, so again, another valuable use of eDNA. And so again, this, the outcome here is this sort of early warning and forecasting tools to mitigate harmful effects of these organisms. So a third opportunity is sort of a larger scale understanding of ecosystem patterns. And this is really trying to understand sort of the dynamics and stability of Maine's coasts. This is a project being headed up by Kate Beard at the University of Maine. Uh, as well as uh, almost all the teams sort of involved in this project, where we're going to be sampling along these different sites along the coast, um, from mid-coast to down to Casco Bay. And the goal here is to do sort of temporal sampling over, uh, over, this, over the year, uh, along these different sites going from sort of what you call sort of near outer coastal sites up, up into the estuaries and even into fresh water and sort of follow the, the, the dynamics of, of really all the organisms that are there. And this is the real power of eDNA is that I think is to be able to look at patterns, not only of an individual group of organisms, but across all species and to see if we can start seeing associations that we've never been able to see before because we're all each studying our own group of organisms and not really talking to each other. Um, so this is this will be a fun uh, project to see how well we can develop this. And again, this is looking across you know both <coughs> very large spatio-temporal scales of from tens to hundreds of kilometers, as well as uh, potentially, and then looking across these coastal gradients from lakes to the coast. And ultimately, you know, relating this to, to time changes as well. Another project that I'm involved with is just using microbial communities in, as indicators of change, or we refer to them as biosensors of change, really. Um, and this is focused more on bacteria, uh, where we know that bacteria are incredibly diverse. They have they're metabolically diverse. They're abundant. They can change, they can grow rapidly. They can respond to change very rapidly. One thing we're kind of interested in is what happens when you have a, a storm event. Um, were it not for COVID, we probably would have gone out yesterday uh, and done some sampling along the Dam Riscata here and then gone out tomorrow after the, the storm passes tonight and sampled again to see what kind of um, changes there might have been sort of in the microbial communities and how quickly they're responding to these changes. And again, this, this relates back to sort of environmental change. And the thing with, with bacteria is that not only we, can we identify who's there, but then we use other techniques related to RNA and protein to actually ask what they're doing. Uh, and again, this is all based on just going out and sampling environmental samples. So now I want to talk just a little bit about applications. 
give a couple of examples. I think there's multiple examples, but I'll just for the interest of time, I'll talk about uh, one aspect, which is developing tools for aquaculture. Uh, this is a slide really from Nicole Price, um, who's also involved in the aquaculture uh, research and industry on the coast of Maine. So one of these is developing eDNA tools to predict when and where seed sets for scallops and mussels are expected. We want to improve the tracking and monitoring of these harmful algal blooms, as I described before, because this is really important for farmer operation decisions. If you're going to harvest your, your oysters and you know that there's a good likelihood of a harmful algal bloom happening, well, you may want to do it this week instead of waiting another week or two. Or you may want to wait till the bloom has gone by and, and the water's clear again. And then there's aspects around site selection to reduce the exposure to pathogens um, coming off the land potentially, nuisance species, things that could foul your, your uh, aquaculture um, nets, uh, as well as predators. And you can do this, again, the power of eDNA is that you can potentially do this using one tool. Another application is relevant to fisheries. So there's a lot of interest, especially NOAA, for example, has a lot of interest in using eDNA for stock assessments, and especially of lesser commercial species. Um, I'm showing a shrimp boat here. The shrimp have kind of left the Gulf of Maine, we think, but do we really know that? Um, we're hoping that eDNA can help us sort of understand better those, um, do those stock assessments. Some organisms, some species like cod and, and uh, uh, haddock, you know, they, they have very good models for those. It may not, eDNA may not contribute as much, but for other species like halibut, um, eDNA could be a very important tool for assessing those stocks. It's also, you know, looking at, again, these species migrations and rain, shift, rain shifts due to climate change is another application. And ultimately, you know, the goal here is that to use these tools to improve management decisions around stocks of commercial fish. So another opportunity that, you know, as a scientist, we're really excited about is the opportunity to do new science. And I've touched on this just a little bit. And I'm now going to show it's quite a complex diagram. I don't want to leave you with the notion that life is simple. Uh, <laughs> we try to simplify these talks as much as we can. But um, this is actually a, a network diagram that was developed actually in my lab and the lab of some colleagues of mine. This is what we're looking at here is the global iron microbiome. And I could talk for another hour about the global microbiome, but I won't. Um, I'm using this just as an illustration. And what we've done is we've gone and sampled uh, quite a few different places around the world. We've done it, our colleagues have done it, other people have done it, and we've gotten their data uh, through genetic databases. And essentially what we're looking at here is a species map. And the circles here, you can think of as an individual species. And the size of the circle is sort of the abundance or the relative abundance of that species. You can see there are some that are very abundant and then others that are very small circles that we only find occasionally. And then the linkages between them are showing, or the lines between them are showing linkages. The, the thicker those lines, the more commonly we see these two species associated with each other. And the very thin lines means that we don't see them very associated at all. And if there's no line that we don't see them, we, we just sort of see them as individuals by themselves. And again, this, the, the power of this is this is all done again by going out and extracting uh, DNA from the environment and analyzing it. And so I think, you know, as a scientist, there's a lot of uh, really interesting questions you can ask. Um, you know, why are some of these so abundant? Why are some species highly connected to others, whereas others don't have any connections to the other groups? There's some groups that are quite strongly connected to one another, but they're not that connected to the rest of the organisms that we see. And so you can use your imagination and, and, this, and uh, think that maybe instead of bacteria, these are different fish species. Um, we would do the same type of analysis. We could potentially look at, say, fish species and kelp, um, what associations there are there. 
So you can sort of imagine how you can use this type of, of data to, to start teasing, to start really understanding sort of associations across all different taxa that we've never been able to do before. And I think as a scientist, that's probably the most exciting thing that um, will come out of some of this eDNA research. And so finally, I just wanna uh, sort of summarize here by talking about some of the promises and challenges of eDNA. And um, in terms of promises, I think, you know, better species detection, improving diversity estimates uh, of organisms, detecting rare or invasive species, reconstructing past communities is another potentially really powerful tool. Um, looking at these patterns of dis species dispersal, especially by looking at larval stages. You know, eDNA is relatively cheap uh, compared to a lot of other methods that people use to go out and assess, especially things like fish or even uh, invertebrates, seaweeds. Um, because it really does just require going out and getting some water. Uh, and then doing these integrative data sets for ecosystem forecasting could be very powerful, ultimately leading to better ecosystem management. There are definitely challenges and I, uh, and I you know, for the promises I've just given, uh, I mean, I could come up with another half dozen easily. For challenges, there's, uh, a smaller list, but certainly the technology development and proof of concept are, are big challenges. I think um, I think proof of concept we're, we're pretty well along with. I haven't gone in, I mean, there's a lot of technical details that I haven't gone into that are challenges and how well we'll be able to overcome all of those is, is gonna be, is, is one of the things that, you know, we're hoping to figure out in the next few years. Um, then there's what I call sort of hype versus results, <laughs> which is always a challenge for sort of a new area of science. There's always a lot of excitement and you can call a certain amount of hype that gets uh, promoted with a new type of science. And the key there is that you've got to get results. If the hype curve is too much and the results curve is too little, the science will wither away. Uh, so it's important to have, to have that balance between the sort of the excitement about it and what we think it can do and being able to show what it can actually do. And then there's acceptance, which I think is another challenge um, just because, you know, this is a new technology to most people. It's a new concept um, and it's uh, hard to see. And so actually I'm gonna throw out a question here sort of to the audience of, of how do you think that uh, we can engage the interests of stakeholders and the general public with something that you can't see or hold. I mean, DNA is, it's a molecule. Um, and <clears throat> when you extract it or isolate it from water, we end up with a little clear tube of water that you, of liquid that you can't really see anything in until you take it to some kind of a DNA analysis tool. So that I think in itself is, is a bit of a challenge and how we're gonna deal with that is, is an important question. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Um, I put up a, a picture here of a lot of the participants who are involved in the main eDNA project, as well as our funding sources, primarily the National Science Foundation, um, as well as um, some of our great donors. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, great job. Uh, first question here is, how long does an organism's DNA hang around in the ocean? Uh, so again, that's a, a good question. We think that obviously you have currents, things, like, especially in the ocean, you're going to have tides, currents moving things around. From the studies that have been done, it, it, it doesn't appear that, um, that, it la that DNA la necessarily lasts that long in, when it's in the water column. That, Either it gets degraded, it gets diluted so much that you don't find it anymore. So people have been able to show that, you know, along, well, for example, the Damascata River or something like that, where the, the lower river would have a different population than a few miles upriver. Um, and you would be able to see that fairly consistently. That's one of the things that we need to test, but, um, but that's uh, what generally we're finding. 
Okay. Uh, is there a shared genetic database of all ocean species, or how do you match your data to specific species? Yeah, so that's a really good question, important question. Um, so there are shared genetic databases. Uh, there, so there's GenBank, which is run by the, the sort of the U.S. government, um, which is the main repository for genetic information. Um, people are discussing the need, to the de degree to which we should be setting up databases that are more species specific or regionally specific. Um, but ultimately your results, I mean, the key to this is that really the results that you're gonna get from these types of analysis are certainly from the meta barcoding analysis that I talked about, um, where you're comparing all these different organisms within, within a single sample is really dependent on how good your database is. And so, for example, with bacteria, you know, we have very good databases now. I can remember when GenBank had, um, definitely aging myself, but probably a few hundred sequences of bacterial DNA in it now. And now there's literally millions. Um, if, yeah, probably, well, still millions. Um, and so as those databases have gotten better and better, we get, we feel much more confident about, you know, our ability to detect things. I'd say that, you know, certainly with some organisms, fish, for example, I think there's pretty good databases. Where we really don't have good databases is with a lot of invertebrates, um, uh, marine worms, things like that. Uh, that, you know, so when you do the sequencing and you get back a lot of uh, analysis, you'll get things that are just identified as chordata. Well, that's something with, you know, uh, some type of a, of a backbone or, and, uh, but you don't have much more to go on than that. Um, so, so those databases, and I, my guess is that those databases are going to develop very rapidly over the next uh, four or five years, and that that will become less and less of an issue. But right now, that's some of, one of the things that we have to grapple with. Thanks. Is this a tool that you could use to see changes in microbial communities due to climate change? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think, so one of the things I didn't talk about was that we're going to also be doing, in addition to collecting DNA, we're also collecting a lot of oceanographic information and limnological information from either the lakes or the oceans that we're sampling um, and trying to tie that to the changes in the microbial populations. To really look at that, and that's one of the things that I think that, you know, having a longer term study will be important for is being able to tease apart those changes because seeing change is always a bit of a challenge because you have to do it over time. And the more time you have and the more other variables that you can understand that might be causing that change is, is really important. Um, and that again comes back to these sort of these issues around the data management and I didn't really talk too much about that but we often refer to this as a big data problem or, or a big data project as well uh, because you really have to do you know a lot of sort of a lot of statistical analysis to try to understand <clears throat> for example whether it's temperature that may be causing a change or whether it's pH or whether it's some other aspect um, of a, the changing in the environment. And, but <clears throat> with microbes, uh, you know, we're actually probably less is understood about changes of microbes in the environment due to climate change than for example, seaweeds where we're seeing these quite dramatic shifts. And it's again, it's probably, the, it's partly be just because we haven't been monitoring them long enough. Um, because with microbes, we really are almost restricted to DNA-based methods or molecular-based methods for detecting them and understanding them. So. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think we've just got time for one more question. Uh, so we wanted to ask, uh, what partners are you working with to apply what you're learning to managing our ecosystems? Yeah, so uh, 
within the state, this is an important uh, aspect of the project is really to the engagement of, of different stakeholders. Um, so we're working with the Department of Marine Resources. They're probably, in terms of sort of management of the coastal ecosystem, fisheries, things like that, they are you know, sort of the main, one of the main players in that. Um, and so they're very interested in how we can apply these technologies um, to those you know, fisheries-based questions, harmful algal bloom-based questions. I mean, they do a lot of testing of the waters here for, for, for our harmful algal bloom, harmful algal blooms. So working with them, um, also the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, we're also interested in working you know, with different um, nonprofits, with conservation organisms as well. There's a, a really nice opportunity here for doing citizen science as well. Um, we want to get people involved um, in doing that, going out and sampling. Uh, Mike Kennison has been doing that quite a lot at the University of Maine in the late in freshwater lakes, looking at fish, um, getting different groups to go out and sample water, to send them samples. So that's, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Obviously the pandemic has uh, uh, put a crimp in our ability to do a lot of that work this, um, this spring and summer, uh, but hopefully in the next six to 12 months, we'll be ramping that up again. 